Okay, so I guess this is a good time to start, Eddie. And we're uh, rolling. We're... Awesome. So um, let me also synchronize this uh, with my YouTube uh, as well. So if you can hear me, just uh, give me a little uh, thumbs up or uh, if you can't hear me, let me know in the chat or let one of the folks who's in the chat um, let me know. This is a webinar around reliability in Kubernetes. We're going to talk through a few things today, such as what does good look like um, and what are some of the challenges that large organizations uh, with Kubernetes have. And so one of the things that I wanted to do, first of all, was to introduce who I am and why I think my background is relevant to this subject. I ran SRE practices at uh, American Express for a few years, um, as well as at JP Morgan, uh, and more recently, a company called SIBO, a, a cloud uh, computing company. And now I'm working uh, at Canonical, the makers of Ubuntu, to build the Kates distribution, micro Kates and charmed Kates. And so I've seen a lot of interesting patterns over the way people use Kubernetes to deploy workloads. And some of the challenges that arise when you're trying to um, monitor systems reliably, but also the challenges when integrating those systems back into things like ServiceNow, uh, ticketing desks, and other parts of the organization that don't work so well. So I think that one of the key challenges that I want to uncover today is going to be around complexity. The second one is going to be around personas and the democratization of who can look at issues, who can resolve things in clusters. Because as we'll come to understand, it's actually not as easy as it seems the larger your business scales. In, in fact, there, there's an inverse relationship there. So aside from me just talking, there's some companion stuff that goes with this. Um, I'm just going to switch over and you should be able to see my desktop now. Again, please ping me, scream from the hills if you can't see anything. If things are too small as well, chime in and I'll do my best to monitor the chat. Um, in fact, I'll just do that now and start the chat controls as well. So I've got a resource here uh, called Cloud Native Skunk Works uh, GitOps Bootstrap. And this is a, a sort of a, an, a repository that is based around what we're doing today. What this entails is a set of applications that install within Argo CD, which is a popular GitOps um, platform. I have no preference for any GitOps platform. I, I like being able to write things in Argo because it's easy. There are many others. What's important, though, is that this is the reference point uh, for which I'll be speaking around today. I'm going to take some time to talk a little bit about how we actually deal with stuff. I'm going to talk about how we can then make it better. And hopefully the police sirens going by will be able to then look at uh, how this deploys optimally, how you can start to apply your reliability goals and improve upon that. Before I get into this website, uh, this uh, repository, and before I talk too much about this, I want to just step back a moment and look about look at what I was talking about in terms of this wider organization. So today we're going to look at how do we set up um, a high level workload, monitor that workload, and effectively employ the right kind of targets. And what are the challenges around that? Before I do any of that, I just want to do a quick recap of what do common SREs look to do with workloads. So a workload being a pod or a service that's doing some sort of process. And what do they look to do to make sure that's reliable? How can somebody in their team say, hey, Mary, John, is this, is this a reliable service? Is it improved in reliability or decreased? So typically what SREs will do is they'll employ something called golden signals. And one of the popular top fives to that is reduce. So reduce uh, is around rate, errors, duration, uh, utilization with an English S and saturation. And the theory is if you have monitors for each one of these five signals, you should have a good high level understanding of what's going on in that service. And I think we all know that that's, uh, that's wishful thinking, but it does get us part way, right? You, you can tell a lot of stuff if you can figure out a lot of this, uh, a lot of these signals. So if the utilization is capped out and the rate is exceeding that, then you probably know that service needs to be scaled out. So I've mentioned CATs. Now, just before we go further, let's just have a quick look at CATs and get to know what that is. I've listed all the tools I'm using out also in this repository. So if you see a few things you're not familiar with, check that out. And otherwise, I'll be happy to help. CATs is our bank workload for today, right? So it's my, my cat picks generator that I have running. It's super crucial for my business. Um, 
it's going to serve as a talking point for whatever. This could be your card processing platform. This could be distributed set of microservices with a back end. It's not super important. What's more important is around the monitoring part of the conversation. And again, this is where I'm really excited to talk a bit more about what some of the innovation Commodore is bringing to the space and what are some of these challenges that we're looking to overcome. And that's actually why I was so excited to, to collaborate on this. So I did promise that we talk about the installation. And you can see that I've separated these things into various workloads. So I have a logging layer that I put in, which is Loki. I'm quite a big fan of Loki because uh, Grafana have doubled down on having um, a scalable type of solution where if you have um, something running on microcates, which um, I have a bias towards as a, as a low footprint Kubernetes, you might want to run Loki locally. And then if you want to scale it up, you can run Loki distributed the same uh, with the components of Miamir uh, and some of the other project components um, in Thanos as well, I believe, uh, which, is, which is an open source project as well. What I like about this is that Loki uses uh, Promtail and Promtail, in my opinion, is superior to Fluentbit just because of the way that relabeling comes out of the box and some of the constructs being Kate's native. I've also got Cert Manager in here because it's utility that I want to accept, access my cluster from the web with, but also to pronunciate that you can also have problems at this point in the flow, right? You can deploy an application with an invalid certificate and we need to understand uh, what the implication of that is. The observability stack here, as you'll see in the website, all of these things are, are segmented. The observability stack, which is under uh, templates application underscore observability is cube prom stack, which is a very prominent open source project that contains Grafana and Prometheus uh, with, a, with a bunch of uh, CRDs. Mine's loading a little slowly right now. Could well be because I'm streaming it uh, 20 uh, megabits a second. We then have uh, Trivi, which is a, a great little security scanner. I, I used, uh, what I quite like about Trivi um, is that if I go, I think it's scan results or vulnerability reports, I can sort of switch over and see what's going on in my in my cluster, right? So you can see there's some criticals. Uh, on, there's a critical on the CATS application, which is another story entirely for another webinar. Uh, and then of course, I've got Commodore as an application, which I pass my key through to, and then I've got Bootstrap. So let me explain how this works. And for those of you who are familiar with Argo CD, I apologize, but this is a little recap. So this repository is sort of self-assembling. What happens is when you have Argo CD, you can point it to a repository and it runs a Helm operation on that repository. So I've just combined that so that I can say Argo CD, look at this repository and look at what's in the templates, which are other applications. So it kind of acts as a springboard. So we go to our Argo CD, we can see that we've got our Commodore, we've got logging, we've got Nginx, et cetera. And also what's kind of fun with that is you can add additional objects inside of uh, this repository. For example, if I provision cert manager and I want to also include a cluster issuer, it will inject the owner reference back to the bootstrap. So I can see that the cluster issuer for Let's Encrypt uh, is associated with the bootstrap provider. This also gives provenance and it allows you to do a kind of a concertina effect, like a big tent up and uh, out and then back in. You can see what I've done here, and little uh, little note is I've got these broken hearts because I was provisioning uh, my domain name just before this uh, webinar. So I've got these little broken hearts because the certificates aren't completely provisioned, but what I can see is the provenance of the certificates all the way back up to the bootstrap. So that's what we're dealing with here today. We've got bootstrap that will deploy out cats, cert manager, Commodore, um, Nginx, observability, and a bunch of other bits and pieces. And that's a nice place to start because you can give this a go. You can um, literally yes. grab. Yeah. So I turned to hope that we can't see your screen if you're trying to show anything. We can only see you. Okay. Uh, let me have a look. Let me, that's a very, very good thing for me to remember to turn on. <laughs> so where were we? How far did we get? Shall I, shall I recap? Yes, please. I think uh, go back like five minutes. I apologize, folks. Thank you. I, I do. I do. Uh, thank you. I, I was share, to be fair. I'm 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 streaming on on two platforms simultaneously, so I apologize. So, just to recap, I mentioned us having um, reduce, right? So this idea that SREs are looking for signals in workloads and figuring out how to kind of write ways of getting those out. And before we get to that point, I want to explain the platforms we're using. I mentioned that we've got everything boxed as a set of Argo CD 
applications, these applications are deployed out. And if you would like to, you can simply follow the guide here and deploy this on your own Kubernetes as you want. What's really nice as well is that in the root of this YAML, if you have a key for Commodore, it will install Commodore. If you don't, it won't install it. Equally, if you don't have a page of duty key uh, installed, it won't install it. These aren't these aren't destructive, right? So it won't deploy something out that fails and breaks. It will just install the right applications to suit you. So assuming you have all that set up, then what I want to do is to talk through a few of the tactics and techniques that I've used um, that are actually really small and easy to do, but really help you out, right? So one of the things is to add annotations wherever you can, but also to make your life easier uh, by any means possible. So because I didn't have the screen on the Zoom share here, I just want to go back to this recap of provenance is really important. And I've illustrated it in a couple of ways. You can see it both in the left screen under Argo, but also if you go to your ingress, you can see uh, that we have, a, we have an owner, uh, a reference, in fact, on this file. And what's really nice about that is that it manages, in fact, I don't think I can, I can see the status field <clears throat> without doing a wide. But what's nice about that is it will destroy it when the bootstrap gets pulled up. So it's really important that we have this kind of system to refresh our clusters and to almost like do a, a setup and tear down style kind of thing. I also like the fact, as I mentioned a moment ago, that by having the app of apps pattern, this means that the values for the app of apps can be set purely inside of the bootstrap. This is a technique that we use quite often. So I have exposed these. I'm deleting these after my um, after my webinar, so I'm not too fussed if people see these. These are just keys. They're not. There's nothing um, super uh, super nefarious if if someone wants to look at these. But for example, the Pager Duty key uh, or my Commodore key. In this kind of process, I can plug these into Argo directly. Now, if I'm using Vault HA or I'm using Sealed Secrets, you only have one place that you need to update your secrets. Right? It's only in the Bootstrap. This is really good, and we'll get on to talking about this a bit later on, but when you have federated teams, you can then start to deploy secrets out through applications without needing to know about it. So we've talked about the setup and the installation, and hopefully by now you've either understood kind of what we've got deployed, and again, I'll just refer to all these pods sitting here, or you understand kind of where we're trying to go with this. You can see as well, I've got, um, I've got an, uh, an insecure URL here, purely because I have newly provisioned um, my new domain. And you can see here that the domain load balancer, which is actually down here, is operating as an Nginx application. And that domain load balancer uh, is awaiting a certificate uh, from the DNS propagation. If you're not aware, when you buy a domain name, it's not instant that that domain name associates with your IP address. There's, there's a level of propagation that goes down through all the registrar services until eventually it propagates. And so therefore, Cert Manager has to wait for that propagation time before it can then um, actually validate you are the owner of the domain name if you're doing a, a, a DNS-based check. You can also do other forms of check um, as well, but still, this takes a little bit of time. So I've explained the layout. We can see what's happening now. I want to talk a little bit more about the application workload, and I want to start to bring some other things to light. So if I look at my stateful set, and I'm very intentionally moving between um, various ways of viewing this. I have no personal preference whatsoever. And you'll see that I have cats. Now we go down to our volume claim template, right? So typically speaking, when you're on a cloud provider, one of the big challenges is that each cloud provider gives you their own set of opinions on what storage class naming conventions should be. So GKE, EKS, uh, whether you're using Linode or any other system, uh, in this case, I'm using DigitalOcean, has its own opinion. So I can use XFS storage. I can use the default block storage. A big problem that you often see when you have product engineering teams deploying out CATS applications and whatnot is that they will get the storage name wrong or they'll get any other number of parameters wrong simply because they're running off a template and maybe they haven't templated that out. And so what I, what I want to do is I want to show you like how can I change something uh, and then let's have a look at what kind of things I've got in place to pick up on that change. One of the segue I'll make, and referring back to my document before we get down that rabbit hole, is I've, I've only really explained this so far, right? I've explained this box, which is a Cakes cluster running all these services. I've spoken a little to about Commodore, which I'll come to in a moment, but I haven't really spoken about another component here, which is PagerDuty, which is the ITSM. 
pager duty, if you are familiar with it, is very much um, a deep seated tool that's embedded in a lot of enterprise organizations because it has very strong ties to um, some of the ticketing systems such as ServiceNow. And so it's great. However, there are a lot of challenges with PagerDuty. It doesn't give you that kind of granular information. Um, and typically people will install the link from Prometheus to PagerDuty directly, but they won't really uh, build custom queries or rather custom messages. And so you get some really kind of unhelpful uh, statements that come through this, right? So you'll see the, the set of labels that are firing, and we're lucky because this is one of the default alerting rules that has a little bit of text to it. However, when a team is building a service such as cats, they often won't write a Prometheus alert rule. Um, and you know, if they're lucky, they'll have an SRE who cares about this stuff and might write an alert rule. But often it will be uh, falling back to the default rules that come with Prometheus. You know, to just to have a quick look at those rules, you get a whole bunch when you install the observability system. In fact, I believe that it would be represented as uh, PROM rules, which are yeah, Prometheus rules and alerting rules, which are installed as CRs, but they're not really tailored to your application, right? I don't really understand what the optimal is. And we've got this idea of reduce, but it's not really telling me our cats being served around the internet. Is everybody happy? And so, you know, this is kind of one of the first challenges that I wanted to bring to life is that using PagerDuty doesn't give you the full story. And it's a challenge because it often also doesn't give you any uh, integration with the cluster that it's talking about, right? So it's it's a webhook, it's receiving data, but it, it doesn't know anything about the cluster. And so coming back to that thing I mentioned a few minutes ago about annotations is, you know, I, I had a, did a similar thing um, earlier on in Commodore with Argo. And what I did was I used an annotation to link these things together. Like I haven't got time to jump around the internet. So I've got these little links um, and I can just go back and forward between these dashboards. And what was really nice was that it just saves me time. And I think this is um, something that experience speaks of a little is when you're dealing with large scale systems, time is really important. Like you have enough time spent, uh, as I'll go on to explain, dealing with the bureaucratic side of things. If you can start skipping and linking things together, it really speeds stuff up. You know, I've seen people put cube configs in the notes of PagerDuty. You wouldn't believe it, but they do that in an incident because it's the single source of truth for many people. Um, many organizations who pre-Slack hadn't embraced a, a sort of a, an instance response channel or a war, war room channel would use PagerDuty. And there are tons of problems, let alone security concerns of doing stuff like that. Talking a little bit around a larger scale organization, what, what is one of the problems that comes to mind when you wanna kind of fix an incident? Let's say that we have a challenge, right? Let's just go ahead and think about a challenge. So I mentioned that cats might be deployed with a different um, a different storage class. Let's just go ahead and break this, right? So I'm just going to change my storage class and call it something that doesn't exist. Cats is a staple set. So I'm going to uh, delete the staple set and reapply it. And we'll talk about why is that a problem uh, in the meantime. So just give me a moment to make sure this is actually deleting. What I'll do is I'll do a, a terminate on the current sync. And I will go ahead and check that that's working. So let's terminate that. Yeah, there we go. Okay, it's deleting, great. And then it's being recreated by the bootstrap. So why is this a problem? Well, this is a problem because I might be managing 15 clusters. I might have three of those in production. However, if you ever worked at a company with more than about a thousand people, um, typically there, is, there are processes involved around getting to production. And, and if you don't have those, then you you're consider yourself very lucky, right? Um, production clusters tend to have a lot more scrutiny, especially when you're working in financial institutions. And they will typically have break glass protocols. A break glass protocol is when you have to request a, an audit trailed special one-time access to that cluster. They will usually do this if they're sophisticated by generating you a service account token. If they're unsophisticated, it will be giving you a limited SSH uh, access to the underlying machines of that prod cluster. If you can believe it, that that's uh, that's actually a thing. So if you imagine these nodes, right, being under my production cluster, you will often be granted uh, an exemption where your break glass will say you have access to this box via this proxy, um, and therefore you can go and debug something. But already we're coming at the wrong layer, right? I'm coming at the node to debug something that's going on at the application level. And 
it's it's an extra set of steps that I haven't got time for to deal with in my life, right? Like there's so much other stuff I need to be getting on with. So, you know, when I start thinking about the future of where things are going, and I wanted to start showing you folks sort of why I think it's really interesting um, that we have folks like Commodore trying to solve these challenges, I just think it's super important to set the context of why are these problem spaces being explored? Because they are real problems in large companies. They're real problems. So getting access to a production cluster, um, I've had a production incident where I think it was at least two hours, even with an emergency request. And to talk through how this actually works is you would typically open a ServiceNow ticket, right? So that ticket would be opened. That would then probably go through at least one, if not two, perhaps even three layers of escalation before that ticket ticket would then get answered and you would then get a response. And so the opportunity to me is that when you have a platform that is effectively able to give you real-time um, information about the state of the cluster without having to jump into it and even you know modify that cluster or, or work with that cluster, I think that's super interesting. And so for me, there's a real interesting coalescence between GitOps and also this idea of SRE observability and automation, this remote troubleshooting. And so that's what I wanna really get into in a moment. So before you get there, you know, we've, we've now connected our ticket to service now, we've now got our response, we've now jumped into a node on that cluster. I've now managed to get the cube config of that cluster temporarily. And at this point, I've got to figure out what was the error. You know, I might have had this, I might have had an issue come from PagerDuty, for example, this is a Prometheus error, which was when the admission hook um, miss, didn't, didn't trigger. And I think it was also after a, a job update. But you know, getting to the point of this being useful and actually resolving could be getting close to hours, right? And so whilst I just want to see, ultimately, why aren't cats working, right? Why isn't my cat's pod working? Until I can actually get there, there are quite a few steps. And so I think that it's a really interesting illustration that we can get there with something like Commodore. And so I'm gonna come on to talk about this a little bit more now. I, I hope that I've given a good illustration of where some of the pain points are and why it's interesting to start to be able to think about this sort of stuff. So I got a couple of clusters plugged into this and I just wanted to kind of go back before I, before I sort of um, looked at why, why I found this interesting is I had a couple of clusters plugged into this over a while. And what was really interesting is I had my Raspberry Pi cluster and I looked um, historically over the past few weeks. And it was quite cool because one of the things, and I've replicated it here a little bit, is what I could see is that I had a bunch of scan reports that were failing from Trivi, but they weren't failing. What was actually happening is I had criticals in my cluster. And I thought this was a really cool way of exemplifying that, that they had job runs that were actually failing on the vulnerability scan. So it was reminding me that I have to go back and check this out. I think it's really interesting because when we start to think about the personas, not just the access, that's when it's something that I think is really interesting as a, as a bit of a game changer. I mentioned all of this stuff around, you know, an SRE requesting access to try and figure out what's going on in a production cluster. That's just the SRE. That's just the SRE, let alone SecOps engineer, right? If you've got those vulnerability reports uh, that are failing, that's a whole different thing. And so when you suddenly think about, you know, tooling that makes your life easier and you can start to build out sets of functionality, sets of behaviors in the UX that doesn't require you to jump into a cluster, then you are bringing people closer to solving problems. Now, I mentioned earlier on as well, that one of the things I was really interested in was around this improvement in DX and this idea. And what you can see right now is, let's get to the next stage of our demo. So I mentioned that we have this whole problem with our uh, persistent volume claim not binding uh, because of our demo. And what's really cool to me is that you can see, again, we've got an issue here, and I can also then understand exactly with what's going on, right? I would have had to do, to do the same thing, right? That, that same action in this example, in this world, would have taken me three to six hours, right? And if you're working in a company that's making millions of transactions a day, you know, that's, that's huge volumes that you're missing, you know, because let's face it, everyone loves cats. And so I can quite simply see uh, with Commodore that we've also got this failure. Another thing that's interesting, um, or at least is useful, that I, I've, I've really enjoyed is actually this idea of integration into Slack. Because as I alluded to, 
companies wholesale, even large enterprises are moving to Slack and they're kind of standardizing on Slack. And so it, Prometheus has some really good Slack integrations. However, Prometheus, again, unless you build your own webhooks, doesn't take you to the cluster. So anything that helps to give you direct cluster information and integration really solves that for you. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna go back and say, hey, I figured out that cats aren't deploying. Um, perhaps you as a, as a team shouldn't have pushed that shouldn't have pushed that issue or should have pushed that uh, PR into your repo. Obviously I've simulated that because I'm using my parameters. So if I go back now, I remove that and it's going to change the injection into cats. I'll see that when I, de I delete my cats uh, stateful set, cats are all good. So I'll just do that again. And we can go back to Commodore to have a bit more of a look at some of the features that I also end up using all the time. So if I go delete, in fact, I'll just terminate because we're in a, in a mid sync um, and our cats will come back and then we'll be good. We'll all be happy. As we can see, the PVC is mounted. Again, it's not always about things um, not starting. Sometimes things fail, right? And so I added a few little extras uh, that we can play with here, right? So cats is on my main branch. Let's think about a developer trying to do something good, right? They're trying to make do something helpful for the team, but it ends up not being so helpful. It regresses the service. So in my YAML values, the cats, I have a, a flag called failure and failure can equal true, right? That failure actually causes the web server to start dropping requests. And so what will happen is we'll get an availability issue. So if I jump into cats, we will see that availability issue um, and we will figure out exactly what's happened. So I like to think that these are pretty, pretty common use cases, right? These are things that actually happen all the time. And by saving ourselves um, the trouble of having to jump through 13 different hoops and to see things brought up, then I think that it's really, really um, a good step in the right direction to democratize, as I said earlier, on that access to investigation. It shouldn't just be the SRE who is figuring this stuff out. It should be a team sport. But building the tools to make that easy and to set those integrations up, absolutely. That's something that your SRE can help you out with. So if we go back to our bootstrap, we'll see that at the top level, the parameters for bootstrap are things like storage class, and that storage class gets passed through and overrides here. However, I want to simulate a direct commit because why not? That's what people do, right? So we'll set failure on to true. Say this is, uh, you know, this is going to cause some problems. And we'll put that directly into main, right? Which is another golden rule uh, that we want to try and avoid, typically in most environments. Just while that's all propagating uh, throughout the system, and again, I, I might do a uh, stateful set uh, reboot just to speed this up so it doesn't roll out. When we think about configuration in general, right? There's a whole bunch of things that people tend to fixate on and find really difficult to understand. And I think that comes into two buckets. One is the configuration constructs within Kubernetes itself, and the other is trying to understand all the configuration of a particular application, right? And so when we have the ability to view it or discuss that configuration in a very simple to consume format, we start to think about that configuration in a new way. And specifically what I'm talking about here would be um, developers are expected to be able to inject environmental variables into pods. They're expected to be able to set configuration maps on those pods, they're expected to do X, Y, and Z. And all these things introduce permutations when they are then running that code on their clusters. So as much as possible, I do like to try and centralize and make that configuration indemnitant. So one of these golden rules that they do kind of fixate on at these companies for good reason is that people shouldn't just be in clusters mucking around and changing things. And that's why I think the traction of uh, GitOps combined with immutable clusters is really where we're going. And I think that that's something that you see a lot more of in the near future. So we've deployed out this change. I, I should imagine that uh, we'll see a synchronization uh, in a moment or two. In fact, I can, I can see that the last sync was my service monitor. So I'll just apply that configuration change. And we can look at how that is read in Prometheus. We can look at how that's read uh, in the cube out, cube, uh, cuddle output. And then we'll look at how that reads in Commodore. And we can evaluate which is easier to read. How do we feel about each one? 
and and what is probably going to be easier to show to a product manager right and i think that one of the things that was interesting to me uh was this idea of as i mentioned a moment ago about changing things such as um you know pvcs such as images because i can totally see there being a value for folks who are looking at your cadence and deployment speed or deployment frequency and so there's this interesting new level of um meta construct around this stuff and do you remember i a moment ago i clicked that job to run right i clicked that that job to run for the vulnerability scan so if i go oh, I go back i think it's because completely if i go back to my vulnerability um scan report as I'm trying to measure this stuff over time, it becomes really useful for me to be able to try and lower and lower my vulnerabilities, just like it does to look at my deployment cadence to make sure that I keep cats healthy, right? I don't want cats to suddenly have availability issues where something goes wrong. And so I think that that's super useful to be able to build up this historical picture. And what was kind of interesting as well is you can start looking at pod events, right? So if we go over like say the past, what, seven days or something. Um, I think I have pod events. Oh yeah, it's okay, so I've got running here. I can look on a case by case basis of what's going on, right? And what's happened. And so for example, when I was, uh, in fact, that's right now, that's the crash loop back off. Um, and that's come from our pod and that's because uh, I've put the, um, the flag set to failure inside that pod. And so again, you get instant uh, instant feedback. But what I also wanted to mention was that building up this long-term view is super useful because when I think about like my, my Jira progress or my, my, my sprint board, I want to say, oh yeah, that was the day we deployed a bunch of stuff or that was release 2.0 or those are the things that we were trying to release. And I think that correlation becomes even stronger um, when you start to get the single pane of glass from a kind of troubleshooting perspective. So if I um, if I update on that, and in fact, if I go back from the events to my service, let's go and look at cats. Um, oh, not me. There we go. That's the one I want to look at. And you can see right now that I got this availability issue coming up in droves, right? And you know, I remember speaking to the folks um, here a while ago, and this is one of the things that. A bunch of people who are writing Terraform and Ansible every day and IAC and they're working in the shell are like, why do you need this stuff in the UX? And I think the thing they don't kind of understand is that the personas of who are, who are using this and who are kind of working on these, these issues and tickets aren't always seasoned, hardcore Kubernetes experts, right? For example, are the pods healthy? Like, it might sound like a no-brainer, but having playbooks is so important. In fact, the amount of time at Amex we spent writing playbooks and committing them into Git was uh, non-trivial, right? So when you think about having the ability to do that, it's super important. And they found it, right? This was my, this was my secret source. So I added failure as a flag into Helm, and failure. If you look at failure, what does it do in my um, cats demo? Let's go have let's go deep dive into the code, uh, which isn't very much all. You can see when bad value is introduced, we start returning a 500, right? We start returning a 500 on that service. And as you may or may not know, Kubernetes performs health checks. And so if we look at the health check for the CATS service, which we could do just here because I'm in the uh, repository, we can see that the, um, the liveliness probe is on that health endpoint. And so the liveliness probe Will fail, and I will see that I have issues. Uh, <laughs> I have issues. I can see that we'll have issues uh, within that, and that it's that it's failed. And what's really cool is that uh, if you integrate this as well, you can go back uh, to get. And of course, I can see my my log saying that Alex has done something stupid. He's introduced failure. So if we rewind the clock, take this out. I could have done this also to the bootstrap, as I said, but. It was kind of fun to be able to show you what a developer might do, right? They might change something in the code. It breaks. We can now see there's an availability issue um, reverted. And we'll push that back up. So I wanted to sort of uh, take stock of what we talked about so far and to just think about this diagram in the context of the next few years and where things are going. I mentioned that we're looking at immutable clusters becoming more of a thing. 
Ubuntu Core, for example, is an immutable operating system, uh, and MicroKates is an can be run as an immutable Kates, more or less, on top of that. And immutable by the sense of you start it with a configuration, and you can't change that for configuration. Like we can we can make that happen, um, and then your workload does whatever you want. That is a trend that is definitely going to in only increase because we're reducing the amount of variables, moving parts. I think that if you don't go down that route and have immutability, then you'll certainly have some sort of remote management capability, such as a GitOps process that has a has a scheduler. And so these things really compound the problem of being able to debug that cluster dynamically. And SRE's job is going to get harder and harder. And you know, I I apologize, I didn't show Grafana, but if we just um, jump in, you can see that uh, Cats is still rebooting; it's doing whatever it does. And um, we go to Grafana. And we go to the load balancer, which I've got on again. It's just a, a random endpoint for now. It's 8080. Does anyone know where it's HTTP? Okay, it's just HTTP web. Um, we jump into Grafana. And the, the point I'm trying to illustrate is that writing log QL uh, for, for, for Loki uh, is a bit of a learning curve. It is awesome, it's powerful, but it's DSL in itself. Also, when you want to look at metrics, right? So being able to uh, write metrics queries can be complex with PromQL as well. They've done really awesome work recently to actually start giving you um, this stuff built in, but still there is a level of institutional knowledge and muscle memory there that needs to be built up. You know, in terms of actually getting to the source of understanding what's going on, I find that let's say we found that a pod has uh, a pod stop working or a pod stop running. So, you know, if we, if we write, wrote a query along the lines of our containers running or name containers that status is not equal to running, and we find our pod, then actually we have to jump back out into, into canines or into kubectl anyway, right? Because we wouldn't have the information. Maybe we would have it if we ran Loki, but again, we'd have to cross correlate between Loki and um, Prometheus at the same time. Many large companies are still using Splunk because of that very feature of being able to do um, metrics from logs, but ultimately anything you can do to reduce that helps enormously. So let's go and see what's going on with cats. Um, okay, so cats, the stateful set, as you might imagine, is is uh, is complaining. It's saying, hey, I don't want to roll out. Um, so what I'll do is I will just delete cats or redeploy it. Stateful sets can be like that when there's a persistent volume claim attached on the pod and the pod doesn't want to shut down because of the claim on it and it won't release it. And so therefore the stateful set can end up hanging. Uh, another thing that I want to do is to make sure that my storage is, is mounted, which it is. I can also check uh, with my volume attachment, more general SRE kind of help than actually um, around this demo, but you know the volume attachments are a particularly uh, useful way of making sure that the uh, mounted volume is correctly attached to your pod. And so we have cats and they're all good again. And shortly my availability uh, will be updated when that's all working. And so you can see that, hey, the availability is working. There was no change uh, specifically. However, there was, a, there was a deployment event because I deleted the stable set and redeployed it. And I, and I kind of think it's, it's cool because I can go through this timeline of seeing, these are all the things that Alex did today. And this is the work that he did. So if it were me, I would probably end up taking like a screenshot like this and being like, I don't get paid enough to deal with this. So go fix it. Um, and that, that kind of, you know, exemplifies what I like about the visual element of things. It also reminds me of, um, there are a few security tools that have really come to light recently. I obviously mentioned Trivi, but there's some other ones as well. And what I love about them is the visual element. And I swear the older I get, the more that, well, the less that I have to tinker uh, in the shell and write like cube control to JSON, to pipe JQ, to then modify something through Xargs, the better, right? Because I have to bear in mind that being an SRE these days is not about me being the end user, but I am kind of like the plumbing wizard that gets it through to the product engineering team and often they will be the people on call. So one of the things I didn't do was I didn't tell you what we were gonna learn or rather I did, but I didn't show you the little notes that I wrote. So I hope today we've concluded who I am. Um, hope that you saw what we were digging into. We're looking at kind of a bunch of um, problems that SREs haven't had to deal with. We talked about how clusters are set up. We talked about this particular cluster, how I've put tools together. I didn't dig into things like service monitors with Prometheus. Go take a look at the repositories. The CATS repository has a service monitor in there. It plugs into Prometheus. Prometheus will fire an alert that goes into PagerDuty. 
um, these things happen as well. So if you're curious, please do check it out. I then talked also about diagnosing application workloads. The reality of a situation is, is that Reduce will rarely ever give you the full picture. As we saw, a PVC mount error is not quick to come up. Like that will only show if you've got an alert on quantity of pods. So if I don't have an alert that specifies going from five to six pods and that six pod doesn't come up because I've rolled a change perhaps on that staple set and it's taking over with a new set of storage classes, that won't really show up as an alert unless I've written an alert for that. And so there is a gap there, and that's where a lot of toil is spent with Prometheus. Um, again, with Loki, the writing queries for that. These are both incredible tools, but there is energy that needs to be spent in the observability layer to get the workload layer to actually be accurately monitored. And so when I can come along and not have to do anything, it kind of makes my heart sing because let's face it, being able to read from the Kate's event stream, Kate is pretty smart, right? It can look at scheduling and orchestration. And if we can combine that, with this level of uh, audit trail and also then remote debugging. I think one of the things I didn't mention is that I can do this kind of kind of deal. So I can do sort of scaling events, I can do restarts and all sorts. If you're not in a GitOps paradigm, then we're really laughing because then developers are enabled to be able to sort stuff out for themselves. Looking further, you know, I put Commodore in brackets because you know these folks have a, have a place in my heart because I think that the key challenge to engineers is going to be complexity. And I think, as I said earlier on, it's going to be that your time is in shorter and shorter and shorter supply. Whether you're having to diagnose something that's relatively trivial or complex before you even get there will be the bar to entry. Anecdotally, again, you know, ServiceNow and whatever your IT, whatever your uh, ticketing system is, is just an example, but it can take forever to be able to get access to even look at the problems. Having hosted solutions or having solutions that are orthogonal to the cluster are awesome. Remember that my cluster is cluster in a box. Enterprises don't really operate like this. The observability is kind of usually over here and you'll have a forwarding logger or a forwarding Prometheus uh, remote, uh, remote write or a scraper. However, the, the, the plumbing and the, um, the concepts remain the same. And so if you have taken anything away from this today, I would like it to be kind of look at, evaluate your own SRE practices I've not really spoken much around SLAs, around um, more of the SLO management side of things, more kind of the practicalities of, of troubleshooting and diagnostics. But challenge yourself. Think like, where do I actually spend most of my time? Is it doing SSH shuttle? Am I doing double bastion jumps? Am I doing a uh, cube cuddle from some remote machine just to figure out the log entry? Or am I spending a lot of time in Splunk building um, custom queries? I'd be really interested to know because I think that when you look at stuff like Commodore and you look at what they're doing in terms of um, bringing all of this quite um, deep-seated complexity to the surface, it's extremely exciting to think what you can do with it when you start to get more people from your team involved who has become responsible. Like, okay, you built the thing, you built the cats thing. This is your page. You go manage it, right? You are the, you're your own SRE. Leave me alone. I've got other stuff to do. So <laughs> I hope that um, I hope that that was enjoyable. I hope I didn't sound too cantankerous as well. I'm really not. Um, and if there are any questions, I guess uh, please give me a shout. I'm going to switch back to showing my face, and we can we can talk. If that sounds good. Udi, are you still there with me? Absolutely. Awesome. Um, did all that all make sense to you first, Udi? As, 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 as somebody in the space, you tell me, did, did that make sense to you? Well, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, one of the things you've touched upon is that the work of SLEs is only getting more and more complex as time goes on and more uh, organizations migrate more and more workloads to Kubernetes and then they have to onboard new developers. And I also love how you touched upon the, you know, developers sometimes break things uh, not on purpose. They want to build great features. They want to build great apps, and they try to do it. And sometimes they break things, and then it's the SRE's uh, job to handle it. And they like. What, what do you think? If you had a tool like Commodore, would you uh, would you want to give it to your developers? Would you like to, for them to have the ability to troubleshoot on their own, or is it something that you want to keep uh, like within the SRE team? It's a really good question. Um, I, I think it actually comes down to the economics of scale. 
and hiring and all the really boring stuff. SREs are expensive to hire. They're also hard to geo, independently geolocate. And so putting SREs on call for um, product engineering level workloads. And what I mean with product engineering is I mean people who are building products that your company makes money from, right? Like the credit card scanner or the awesome cats app. So putting SREs on call for those teams is expensive. And so typically companies will um, harmonize around SREs being kind of platform SREs, right? And so I would prefer to give this to my product engineers, right? I'd say, look, this is your service. This is your Commodore page. This is where you can start to say, look, restart services, diagnosis. They become their own L1. I think that's really interesting because they're L1, but they also understand the intention of the product. Um, to, get to, to give you an example, when I worked at, I think at like JPMC, you have a whole bunch of L1 support folks. They understand what the run books are, but they don't really understand the, what the product is trying to do, right? They shouldn't, they don't understand operational tolerances in the sense of like, this is how it should look, this is how it should feel. Um, and I think by giving it to the team, you start to make them feel not only more in control, but you make them feel more responsible, right? Yeah, sure. And uh, what do you think about all the explanations on some of the things that's helpful when uh, Commodore explains why we did that check, why it's important, what it means. I think it's useful, just noise. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely do. And I, sorry, I apologize on my other stream. I'm not sharing your, your lovely face. So let me put you Oh, on. that's okay. There we go, there we go. <laughs> I feel a bit under the vest next to you're, you're fine, because otherwise it's it's me on YouTube talking to myself like some sort of maniacal weirdo. So look, I <laughs> you think- You want to be the only one. Okay, well, here's the thing. Like yeah. um, the checks are useful. Some people will look at those. I, I can't stress this enough. Some people look at those and think, oh, I don't need that. I know about Kubernetes. I know about the workloads but you're not thinking with the broader scale of there are companies who will literally spend tens of thousands of dollars getting someone to get Git repository with a readme that says, if your service does this, do this, you know, it's, it's happened. I've been there. Um, and if you don't have to do that and you can also generate these kind of like triaging options, it's super useful. I mean, again, think about where you want to take Commodore in five years time. I want to see who run who ran those. I want to see if they clicked on that and they said, yes, I've done these activities because that is a level of provenance and auditing of them saying, I swear that I clicked this button, I, I, I checked to see if the service restarted, but it didn't. And now we're getting into the dynamics of actually understanding how our team are operating, which is interesting, right? Yeah, and I think there was a statistic I stumbled upon recently about like how many unaudited changes are going on in, on, average, on average in a cluster. And I don't remember the exact number, but it was something ridiculously high. And I think for an SRE or a platform, uh, engineer, it's uh, a bit scary to, to know that so, so, so many hands are touching your uh, system and making changes that you're unaware of, and you can't even assign blame. Like, uh, you can yeah. do the screenshot and send it over. I think, I think that's, that's, that's super true. Um, it, is, it is the strongest part of that message, that, as I said earlier on, is about, I think Kubernetes is now like Linux. It's no longer just kernel engineers and um, you know, system engineers and coders of the OS it is now people actually like as users. So Kubernetes effectively has users who just want to do, use it to do a thing. And those users also need to know a bit of information about why the thing isn't working. They don't need to be an expert um, at the underlying operating system. And as we can build platforms like Commodore to start to uh, create filters and knowledge filters, that's super useful because filtering the data that's coming out of these systems is work that is worth doing because as i said earlier things will exponentially increase it'll only get more and more you'll find there'll be, there'll be people de deploying ephemeral cakes clusters that are immutable that have a one minute stand up and spin down time and they're using those just to scale out you won't be scaling out by pod you'll be scaling out by cluster dynamically and so can you even imagine the amount of events and debugging and how difficult that would be so with the events timeline and stuff like that you can start to build a picture so i think yes absolutely it's kind of a trend that's only going to get more pronounced and uh, I, I was gonna ask you if, if, when you took that screenshot that said, I'm not getting paid enough. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, I've, I've never been an SRE, I've never had to deal with, with that kind of situation. Is that something that happens a lot when uh, you, you like want to assign blame? You know what? I mean, if, uh -huh. I, if, I'm, putting, if I'm putting, pot, uh, if there's product requests or features here, one of the things I would say is that actually looking at having time frames between things, right? Because if I, uh, Alex, for example, you could catalog how long you spent on a call. And that would factor in your pay, into your pay and other places as well. Like to say, I spent eight hours 
on this tree on this availability issue for this team and it was fixed here and here, here's the attestation i can say that and screenshot that and send it to my manager that has value but also from a from a quantitative perspective to look at how many availability is, issues are we having a month this comes back to the slo story sres are closely following those service level objectives you know which are part of the sla part of the agreement with your customer mm -hmm. and to be able to say look it tells us we've had one minute of availability uh, um, issues, which is within our P99, um, you know, within our four nines. That's great, right? Yeah. If, um, anything else you would like to say, Alex? No, not at all. I would just like to, to thank you for having me for my ramblings. And if anybody would like to play with the stuff that I built, please go ahead and like, uh, you know, on, on Twitter, just, just DM me if this isn't broken or open an issue. But, you know, check out Commodore, check out the way that I've built this stuff. Um, it's quite representative of, of, well, it's very close to a way that we were deploying it of another very large company I worked at um, for, for a time. And I uh, just want to add that Commodore uh, has a two week free trial and you can uh, do the self serve installation yourself. Just go on the website, commodore.com and you can install it and follow uh, Alex's uh, video. We're gonna share the recording with everyone and uh, you can try out Commodore uh, for yourself. You can uh, also check out our open source tool, uh, ValidCube, validcube.com and join our newly minted Slack community. And uh, that's it. Thanks everyone for uh, joining. And thank you, Alex, for leading this uh, workshop and You're very sh welcome. Sh showing Commodore uh, the, the way only you can. So uh, till next time. Thanks, everyone. Ciao. Bye-bye.